Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome for, to another edition of Ask Me Anything. We are gathered here today to talk about cervical cancer. Bienvenidos, amigos. Estamos aquí una vez más en nuestra edición de Pregúntenos Cualquier Cosa. Y hoy vamos a dedicar eh, la sesión para hablar sobre el cáncer cervical. Uh, we have two very special guests with us today. Um, Astasia Lacey is our maternal and child health director in our Greenbelt site. And we also have Monica Cabrera, who is one of our clinicians, uh, who is uh, doing all of the great work that prevents cervical cancer. Monica and Astasia, bienvenidas. Welcome. I'm so excited to have you here. And um, we are going to be talking about cervical cancer. What is cervical cancer? ¿Qué es uh, cancer del cervical? Can you explain to us a little bit uh, what is that? Yeah. Mean? What does it look like? What what happens when you get cervical cancer? Yeah, definitely. I think it is very important to know what cervical cancer is. And so I think the best way to um, first talk about it is what is the cervix? And so that is the lowest part of your uterus. And so you have your uterus, which is located inside the pelvis. And then down at the bottom is your cervix. And so cervical cancer is a type of cancer that affects the cells of your cervix. Um, so when you're coming in to be seen, these are um, some of the things that we're doing to check you to ensure that you do not develop cervical cancer. Great. And Monica, ¿nos ayudas con la traducción? Ok, eh, entonces el, el cáncer del cuello uterino es, eh, un, eh, así mismo se, eso mismo es el cáncer del cuello uterino, o sea, te, podemos tener cáncer en todas las partes del cuerpo. Lo importante es tratar de prevenir este cáncer. Eh, entonces, ¿cómo hacemos eso? Nos chequeamos eh, cada cierto tiempo con lo que llamamos el Papa Nicolau o la citología, para ver si estamos eh, desarrollando ciertos cambios que en el futuro pudieran llevar a un cáncer del cuello uterino. El cuello uterino está localizado en, al final de la vagina y le decimos la puerta al útero, ¿ok? Eh, entonces, hay, hay, hay algunas mujeres que podemos desarrollar cáncer en esa área. Thank you. That's, that's a very easy way to understand it, right? It's the, yeah. the entrance to the uterus. Um, uh, so to our friends that are watching live, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, we are going live both on Facebook and in YouTube. So send us your questions. We have received some emails already and some chats from other friends. Um, and so uh, one of our friends wants to know, what are the symptoms? ¿Cuáles son los síntomas que, uh, que, que, que tenemos que buscar para cuando hay... El, el miedo de tener este cáncer en el uterino, el cuello cervical. So, Monica, let's start with you. ¿Cuáles son los síntomas que la gente tiene que estar pendiente? Entonces, el, el síntoma más, eh, más importante, el, el que más vemos, es un sangramiento irregular, ¿ok? O un sangramiento muy abundante eh, o un dolor muy fuerte. Cuando tenemos este, estos tipos de síntomas, no necesariamente significa que tenemos cáncer, pero sí son los síntomas eh, que nos deben llevar a ver a un profesional, a ver qué está pasando. Sangramiento abundante o irregular o dolor pélvico. Mm -hmm. So, Astasia. Yeah, so I would agree with Monica that um, some of the symptoms that you can see with cervical cancer um, are not always related to cervical cancer. So it is important if you do have any of those symptoms that she mentioned, which is like a regular menstrual cycle, um, heavy menstruation, uh, pelvic pain. Um, I can mention also if you're having unexplained weight loss, that's something that's important to come in. Um, and a lot of times with cervical cancer, you may not have symptoms at all. Um, so that's why it's really important that you come in for your exams. Um, and just like she mentioned, a lot of things that can be um, misconstrued for other things can be cervical cancer. So it's so important that if you do notice anything that is abnormal, you come into your doctor's office to be seen so you can be checked out. So you talk about uh, getting examined, right? How often should women get a, an examination, a PAP? What is the regular schedule? Yeah. 
So that Jessica and I, or Jessica and I, sorry, Monica and I can piggyback off of each other. Um, you know, that is kind of a loaded question. And so it really depends on how old you are. And so really basic is, you know, between the ages of 21 and 25, um, you are getting a pap smear. And so that usually is recommended every three years for you to start to have that. Um, around age 25 to 30 and up, that's when we start to do your um, HPV test, which is a part of the cervical cancer testing. Um, and if you have that as a part of your exam, it's about every five years. So just kind of a general rule is every three to five years, you should be being seen. Your doctor or your nurse practitioner will let you know, you know, if your pap test is abnormal or there's something that needs to be looked at further. And they may instruct you to come in um, a little bit sooner every year or again, every three to five years, just depending on what your pap result is. Eh, y Mónica, la misma pregunta, ¿cuándo, cuán seguido puede venir una, las mujeres a, a hacerse el Papa Nicolau, como le llamas? Sí, entonces, eh, antes hacíamos el Papa Nicolau todos los años, ¿ok? Eso ha cambiado, hay muchas personas que todavía piensan que necesitan un Papa Nicolau todos los años, eh, pero como dice Astasia, la regla en general es que debemos hacernos un Papa Nicolau de 3 a 5 años, esto depende de su edad, de la edad del paciente, y también depende de los, los resultados previos del, del Papa Nicolau. A veces tenemos, eh, ciert, vemos ciertos cambios en, un, en el Papa Nicolau de este año y decimos, bueno, vamos a repetir uno el año que viene. Quizás no, quizás no vemos cambios y decimos, bueno, lo repetimos en tres años. Si la paciente tiene cierta edad, pues decimos, lo repetimos en cinco años. La lección aquí es que debemos venir... Uh, debemos, debemos visitar a un, a un profesional de la salud por lo menos una vez al año, ¿ok? Para entonces, para que ellos nos monitoreen y decidir si necesitamos el Papa Nicolau o no. Perfecto, lo oyeron aquí, amigos y amigas. Eh, por lo menos una vez al año visite a, eh, nuestro centro de salud donde podemos empezar a, a conocer su cuerpo con ustedes para poder determinar qué pasa uh, después en adelante. Um, So uh, one of the symptoms that you mentioned earlier was a heavy flow and pain. Um, I have sisters and unfortunately all of them, it's, they have heavy flow and very painful uh, periods. So should they be worried? So I think just like Monica had mentioned, a lot of the symptoms can be related to other things other than cervical cancer. Um, so having a heavy menstruation can be something that is normal for your particular body. However, I would say a good rule of thumb if, it, if you notice that your cycle has changed, so if not usually heavy and it becomes heavier, if you're starting to see that you're missing your period, you're starting to develop Uh, pelvic pain that was not there before. It's always just really good if you notice any changes that are not your normal um, flow to be seen by a medical provider. Y, y Mónica, como le, como le acabo de explicar a, a los amigos que están y a las amigas que están viendo, eh, todas mis hermanas tienen esos síntomas. Ellas tienen flujos fuertes y siempre tienen mucho dolor y es, es algo que han tenido toda su vida. Eh, es algo con lo que, que consideran normal, pero sin embargo, ¿qué es lo que hay, acaba de explicar Astasia? Sí, entonces hay muchas variaciones en, en, en las menstruaciones de las mujeres. Algunas eh, la, tienen una menstruación y casi ni se dan cuenta, no les molesta, para otras es más molesta. Eh, entonces, la idea es monitorear el ciclo y ver si hay algún tipo de cambio. Si hay algún tipo de cambio, si ahora es más fuerte que antes, está, es más irregular, eh, si algo ha cambiado, eso es una razón por la cual eh, debemos ver al, al profesional de, de la salud eh, para ver qué está pasando. No necesariamente significa que sea un cáncer, eh, pero sí, definitivamente esa, esa persona debe ser evaluada porque hay un cambio y necesitamos saber por qué. Y una mamá acaba de enviar un texto y nos pregunta, ¿cuándo debo hacerle el primer examen pélvico a mi hija? Entonces, el, el primer examen pélvico eh, debe, o sea, el, el primer Papa Nicolau, en, en realidad la primera citología se debe hacer a los 21 años. 
eh, y no importa si la paciente ha iniciado su vida sexual o no, definitivamente se debe hacer, eh, se debe hacer antes. Ahora, si hay, perdón, se debe hacer a los 21 años. Eh, ahora, si, si ya tenemos una, una, una muchacha que ha iniciado su vida sexual, no sé, a los 16, 17 años, siempre sería, es una buena idea que venga para que sean eh, examinadas, sobre todo para hacer pruebas de eh, enfermedades de transmisión sexual y también para hablar eh, sobre cómo prevenir el embarazo. Very important. Uh, it's Astasia, the question came in from one of the moms uh, mm -hmm. wanting to know uh, when should they bring their daughter in for their first pelvic exam? Yeah, so that is a great question, important question. That is the exam nobody's looking forward to, but it's actually a really um, quick, easy, and almost painless exam. And now, it's different than when we were a little bit younger where you had to start getting your uh, pelvic exam at uh, when you became sexually active or at the age of 18. So that's now moved to age 21, whether or not you are sexually active or not. Um, if though you're having concerns, you know, pelvic pain, irregular menstrual cycles, um, anything that's affecting the pelvis, Um, and you're under the age of 21, you definitely should come in to see your doctor or nurse practitioner. Otherwise, if you're not having any issues, 21 would be the golden age to come in for your. <laughs> Sounds great. Um, I, I have another question here. They, you mentioned a pelvic exam and a pap smear te test. What is the difference? Oh, me. <laughs> All right. So I get this question a lot because a lot of people will um, misconstrue pap smear for the pelvic exam. Um, and so the pelvic exam and like the simplest way to explain it is when your provider is examining problems that deal with not only your pelvis, but also your vagina and your pelvic floor. So it's the entire area that the hip bone encompasses. So if you just think about anything kind of below between the hips, that's what your doctor or your nurse practitioner is going to be looking at when they're doing a pelvic exam. So this is if you're having any bladder issues, um, if you're having any vaginal issues, pelvic Um, pain or issues, um, that's what they will be looking at during the pelvic exam. They'll also be looking at the skin on the outside of the vagina and near the vagina, which is really important. So it's kind of like your overall bigger exam that they're doing um, to just check your full um, genitalia. Um, as far as the pap test, that is the actual test or Papa Nicolai or um, pap smear that is done to check for um, changes in the cells of your cervix. And so the pelvic exam is an exam. The pap test is the actual test that's being done to screen you for cervical cancer. Entonces, Mónica, la diferencia entre el examen pélvico y el, el papa Nicolau. Entonces, el examen pélvico es... Um, para, para hacer una comparación, es como cuando, cuando vas al médico y el médico te examina, o sea, te, te, el, el, la, la persona mira, mira el área, eh, toca el área, palpa a ver si hay algún tipo de, de masa, mira la piel, okay. el, el examen pélvico es eso, un examen. Okay. El Papa Nicolau es una prueba que se manda al laboratorio, o sea, es una muestra. Tomamos una muestra del cuello uterino, para examinar esas células, ver si hay algún tipo de cambio, se manda al laboratorio y el laboratorio nos devuelve un resultado. Entonces, el examen es algo que hacemos nosotros con nuestras manos, con nuestros ojos, eh, y el Papa Nicolau es una muestra que tomamos. Entonces, debemos, eh, debemos entender la diferencia, ¿ok? Porque a veces solo hacemos un examen y no hacemos el Papa Nicolau. Y hablando del examen, uh, eh, Astasia mencionó anteriormente eh, un examen de HPV. ¿Qué es el HPV? Muy buena pregunta. El HPV es un virus transmitido sexualmente eh, que es el responsable del de, eh, cáncer del cuello uterino. ¿okay? 
Entonces, el Papa Nicolau, en ciertas, en ciertas pacientes de cierta edad, okay, hacemos la prueba del, del HPV. Si el HPV está, es, esa persona tiene el HPV, eh, viramos a ver si el, vir, si el virus está causando problemas en el cuello uterino, si está causando cambios. En, en muchas de las veces no causa y bueno, no es tan preocupante, pero en, otra, en otras ocasiones sí puede causar cambios que hay que monitorear. So, uh, you, you, you mentioned earlier, um, what is HPV? Yeah, so that's a great question. HPV, you know, is a viral infection. And so it not only affects the um, genital area, the vagina, or the male uh, reproductive area, it affects our skin and mucous membranes. And so there's so many different types of HPVs. I think there's about over 100 um, mm -hmm. that are out there. Um, which can cause warts and a lot of times don't cause any symptoms at all. Um, so a lot of times, a lot of people do not know that they have it. Um, so it is very common. It can be very scary, you know, to hear that you have it, but just being reassured that it is something that's really common. And most of the time, our bodies do a really good job at fighting it off and healing ourselves um, and it going away. And so when we hear HPV, I immediately think of the vaccine, the yeah. HPV vaccine. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Who gets the vaccine? When should they get the vaccine? And, and what does it actually do? Does it prevent cancer in uh, cervical cancer? So that's another really good question. So, um, The HPV vaccine, what it does is helps prevent infections from a certain type of HPV. And so, like I mentioned, there are a hundred different types of HPVs that are out there. Um, with the vaccine, it protects you against nine of those really important uh, HPVs that have been linked to uh, certain types of cancers. And so, while it doesn't cover you for Um, every single strand of HPV, it's really protecting you from those um, HPV strands that can cause some serious issues. And like I mentioned, it can cause um, vaginal cancer, it can cause cervical cancer, rectal cancer. And so it's really important to uh, get your vaccine to help with preventing that infection. Um, you also ask, uh, does it, I think you mentioned, does it prevent the infection? And so sometimes people will ask if Um, I already have HPV, mm -hmm. well, do I need to get the vaccine? And so, yes. And so, like I mentioned, it covers you for nine of those HPVs. So you may have one of them or you may, be, may have been exposed to one of them, um, but still getting the vaccine is important because it will protect you against the other ones that are um, in the vaccine. And who, who should get the vaccine, the HPV vaccine? Yeah, so men and women, um, particularly starting at the age of 11, but you actually can get it as early as the age of nine. And so the goal is that we really would recommend um, getting the HPV vaccine before becoming sexually active. That way you have that immunity built um, in order to protect you against those HPVs. However, um, If you are already sexually active, you definitely can still get it. As I mentioned before, you may not have been exposed to any of the HPVs, um, and, but if you have been exposed to any HPV that's in the vaccine, you still will be protected against the other ones that it protects you from. So it's super important that you uh, get the HPV vaccine. The earlier, the better, um, but anytime, you know, it's recommended for you to get. You eh, eh, Mónica tiene unas pequeñas dificultades técnicas, pero eh, en resumen, la, la vacuna del HPV previene la infección del de virus que puede transferir, que, puede, que, que está, está alineado con muchos tipos de cánceres y es una vacuna que se puede dar a tantos niños como niñas a partir de la edad de los 11 años. Es importante, es más eficaz si se hace antes de... Oh, Bienvenida de regreso. Uh, 
So, estamos hablando de, de, de la vacuna del HPV y eh, la prevención que trae en, en, en la contracción del virus y también estamos hablando de a quién se tiene que tomar esa, a quién se tiene que poner esa vacuna, a quiénes vamos a vacunar. Entonces, la vacuna eh, es muy importante. Eh, estamos vacunando a eh, los, los varones y las hembras eh, cuando más o menos a los 11 años. ¿okay? Entonces, eso es algo con lo, de lo cual pueden hablar con el pediatra. ¿okay? Eh, es generalmente una serie eh, de varias vacunas, no solamente una dosis. Entonces, el la vacuna lo, lo protege del, del, del virus que puede causar, causar el cáncer de cuello uterino. El virus tiene diferentes cepas. Ahora estamos hablando mucho de las cepas del COVID. ¿okay? Entonces, eh, el virus tiene varias cepas. Algunas cepas eh, causan solo eh, verruga, no es mucho problema, pero otras cepas sí pueden causar el cáncer del cuello uterino. Entonces, la vacuna nos protege contra nueve de estas cepas, las más peligrosas. Entonces, hay personas que dicen, bueno, ya tengo el virus, me pongo la vacuna. Sí, es buena idea ponerse la vacuna, porque como hay tantas cepas del virus, quizás solo han sido expuestas a una, tienen un tipo de, de esta cepa, y entonces al ponernos la vacuna nos protegemos de las otras. Pues es importante eh, entender que, que no es nada más un, una, la responsabilidad de las mujeres el, el mantenerse saludables y sanas y atentas, pero los hombres, los varones, también tenemos la responsabilidad de vacunarnos para ayudar a, a, a eliminar la, la posibilidad de obtener el virus a través de una relación sexual. So, uh, uh, again, it's just as important for women to, to stay alert and to be Uh, watchful and to get the vaccine, but us guys, we have to do the same. We have to get the vaccine so we can prevent yeah. infection to others. Um, so um, a mom just sent in a text um, asking about the concern of is the vaccine, getting the HPV vaccine, is it gonna tell my daughter that it's okay for her to be sexually active? No, so I think that's a great question and a great, um, you know, something to consider when you think about the HPV vaccine. Um, I think it's important to talk to, not necessarily focusing around uh, being sexually active um, and getting HPV. You know, I think obviously at that age, if you're um, getting your nine to 11 year old the vaccine, um, it's important to just discuss that it is a vaccine that's gonna protect you against a virus that you can be exposed to later on in life. Um, I don't think it encourages uh, sexual activity when presented um, in that way. I think what it is going to do is make your um, teen or preteen aware of the risk of, um, you know, activities as you get older and possibly make them more mindful of, you know, choosing uh, responsible and um, safe uh, sexual practices. Um, so in my opinion, I have a 11 year old. Um, and so when we talk about he's gotten his HPV vaccine and when we talked about it, you know, it was more so to inform him, Hey, this is a vaccine that's going to protect you against a virus that can lead to cancer. And I think that's the, the best way to kind of put it at that age. Eh, Mónica, la, la, la pregunta que llegó de una mamá estaba preocupada porque piensa que la vacuna le puede dar un mensaje a su hija de que puedes estar uh, uh, activa sexualmente sin tener ningún, sin tener ningún miedo a alguna infección. Y obviamente esa no es la idea, ¿verdad? Ya. Yeah. Um, entiendo ese, ese, esa pregunta, entiendo ese miedo, pero es, no es más que una oportunidad para hablar sobre la salud sexual y sobre cómo protegernos eh, contra eh, las enfermedades de, tra de transmisión sexual. Entonces, es una buena oportunidad para eh, o sea, abrir la, la conversación y hablar de eh, usar condones, de limitar los, el número de parejas. O sea, estas son cosas reales que todos los jóvenes, todas las personas vamos a encontrar en, el, en, el, en algún momento de la vida. Eh, entonces, si... si eh, abordamos el tema desde ese ángulo, 
desde conocerse más, eh, de, de, de pensar en el futuro y planificar para ciertas eh, situaciones, eh, pienso que es más saludable de esa forma. Eh, de los, de los eh, estudios que se han realizado, en realidad, eh, no se demuestra que es, este tipo de, de conversación o este tipo de, eh, de, de conversación, exacto, eh, lleve a los jóvenes a, a tener más relaciones sexuales. Entonces es un mito. Es un es mito, un mito que, sí, es un mito. De que la vacuna va a, a darle permiso a, lo, a los jóvenes hacer Exacto. práctico sexualmente. So it's a little bit of a myth that the vaccine is going to uh, allow you, the youth to, to be more uh, free. And um, so uh, one question that came in is, I don't have health insurance. How can I get treatment at your health center? And uh, the answer is, of course. <laughs> Hold the number in the, on your screen and we'll love to have we'll it. We'll get you, you an appointment. Treatment? That's yes. right. Call for an appointment. Llame. Si no tiene cita, no se preocupe que el nuestro deber es ser su hogar médico y brindarle los servicios que ustedes se ne necesite a la mejor calidad posible. So we are, we are open and ready to see you all. Uh, what, what is the, the treatment? What happens when you do a pap test and it comes back with a result that tells you something is happening. What happens next? Um, so that varies. So that's a loaded question as well. So it is many factors that come into play. Age is one of them. The type of result that you get is another. And if there is HPV present in the pap smear um, is the other one. So to start off with the age, um, depending on how old you are, I'll give you an example. If you are 21 and um, no, I'll give you the age if you're 30 and your pap smear comes back abnormal. And we have to remember the pap smear is two parts. You have your pap test um, and then you have the HPV test. So at 30, you would be getting both of those things. Um, if your pap smear shows abnormal and there's different types of abnormals, you have your ASCUS, which is one of the more common abnormal results. It's really common, usually it goes away on its own. Um, then you have your low grade cell changes, which is also pretty common. And then you have your high grade, and then it, from there, it's uh, precancerous or cancerous. Um, and so for a woman that is the age of 30, who has say an ASCUS test and does not have HPV present, Um, usually the follow-up would be having her to come back in a year to repeat the pap smear. And that is because with research, we've seen that our bodies fight off the virus um, and that pap, that abnormal pap tests or those um, changes that we see in the cervical cells go back to normal. And your body, usually if you have a really good, you know, or healthy immune system uh, tends to fight off that virus and your pap test um, usually goes back to normal. Um, in cases where the pap test is has a higher uh, grade result, like your low grade cell changes or your high grade cell changes with HPV being present, um, that changes the circumstances where we would then ask you to come in for further testing, such as a colposcopy, which is a test that looks at your cervix under a microscope And we're looking to detect um, cell changes that are not apparent to the naked eye. And if we do see anything that's abnormal, then the second part of that test is to then do something called a biopsy, where we're taking a small sample of the area of concern and we're sending it to the lab. Um, in most cases, most people's tests um, are normal or they're not severe, they resolve on their own and not requiring any further testing to be done. In some cases where, you know, further testing does need to be done, we would recommend that you have something called a LEAP, which is a procedure where they actually remove the abnormal cells to prevent cervical cancer from developing. Okay. Bien larga la respuesta para, para okay. Monica. <laughs> si se consigue algo anormal después de que te hagan el Papa Nicolau, ¿qué pasa? ¿Cuáles son los siguientes pasos? 
eh, que puede esperar una persona que recibe esa información. Entonces, eh, como, como estamos diciendo desde, desde, desde que comenzamos, depende, la respuesta es depende. Eh, uh -huh. Depende de la edad de la persona, depende del resultado que recibimos. Eh, podemos eh, podemos eh, categorizar los resultados como de esta forma. Hay resultados de, o sea, cambios en el cuello uterino que son de bajo grado y cambios en el cuello uterino que son de alto grado. Y por supuesto también miramos si el virus del HPV está presente. Ok, entonces en una paciente joven, en una paciente de 22 años que tiene eh, cambios menores, cambios de bajo grado en el Papa Nicolau, podemos esperar un año. Repetimos el Papa Nicolau. Ese año es para darle al cuerpo de la paciente tiempo para deshacerse de ese virus. Como todos sabemos, los cuerpos más jóvenes funcionan mejor. Entonces, le vamos a dar tiempo a esta paciente a que eh, mantenga una vida saludable, que coma bien, que haga ejercicio, que no fume, ¿okay? para que ayude a su cuerpo, a su sistema inmunológico a deshacerse de ese virus y revertir esos cambios en el cuello uterino. Ahora, cuando hablamos de una paciente un poco mayor, que por ejemplo tiene un Papa Nicolau con cambios mayores o cambios de alto grado, entonces ya debemos profundizar, porque esta persona es un, es un poco mayor, su sistema inmunológico no está tan robusto como antes. Entonces, eh, podemos llegar a otra prueba que se llama colposcopía. Esta prueba simplemente eh, va a, eh, vamos a ver eh, si hay cambios, eh, vamos a tomar muestras para ver, para analizar estos cambios de alto grado. Y de ahí, si vemos que esta biopsia está positiva o eh, estos cambios sí son de cambio, cambios de alto grado, entonces nos mudamos, nos movemos a otro, otra prueba un poco más invasiva, que es para eh, remover o quitar esas células que son anormales eh, en el cuello uterino. Entonces hay un gran rango de posibilidades eh, lo más importante es venir a la clínica, hacerse el Papa Nicolau, para que, determinar cuál sería el próximo paso. Muy bien. And so, friends, uh, we have come to the end of this edition of Ask Me Anything. Uh, thank you so much, Astasia, Lacey, and yeah. Monica Cabrera. For those who joined us late, um, what are two things that they should do about cervical cancer? So. Uh, por, uh, estamos al final de nuestra, de nuestra edición de Pregúntame Cualquier Cosa y les vamos a dar un pequeño resumen. Vamos a empezar con Mónica. ¿Qué, ¿Qué son las dos cosas que la gente debe saber o recordar si se acaban de unir a nuestro, a nuestro programa para, para prevenir o, o estar pendiente del, del cáncer uh, del cuello uterino? Pienso que una de las cosas más importantes es hacer el Papa Nicolau, Beben, ir a ver a su profesional de la salud eh, para realizar esta prueba. Y lo segundo, eh, pienso que sería eh, practicar eh, el, el sexo seguro, o sea, us protegernos, usar condones, eh, limitar el número de parejas eh, para no tan solo disminuir el riesgo del, del HPV, sino de otras enfermedades de transmisión sexual. Muy bien. And Astasia, what are the, the two things that we uh, are our friends who are watching should remember about cervical cancer? Um, should remember about cervical cancer. Um, making sure uh, that you definitely come in to get your uh, pap smear and following your provider's recommendations for how often you should come in is super important. Um, a lot of times people who may develop cervical cancer delay care. So I would say that's one of the most important thing um, to make sure you're coming in as recommended, you're following your provider's instructions. And then if I had to say one of the other biggest things, I think like Monica mentioned is um, practicing safe sex. So using condoms, uh, limiting your sexual partners is important um, and just coming in as recommended by your provider is super important. So you heard it here, friends. Uh, come see us. We want to help you stay healthy and have a productive life. Until next time when we see you again in Ask Me Anything. Ya lo escucharon. Vengan a vernos que les vamos a ayudar a tener una vida saludable. 
Muchas gracias por estar en sintonía y estaremos en contacto.